Happy New Year, New Hope. I realize it might feel a little late to say that, but some of you might not have been in church last week, so I wanted to make sure that I could say that to you. I am praying that 2022 is going to be an awesome, amazing year for you. I'm so glad you're in the house of the Lord today. You are in for a special treat. Our teaching pastor, Mike Bro, is back in the house. And uh, as you know, he is a phenomenal teacher and he is going to be bringing installment to today. Uh, I will be back next Sunday to wrap up this series, but won't you do what you always do? Come on, church, and let's welcome our friend, our brother, our teaching pastor, Mike Bro, to New Hope Church. Here we go. Hey, guys. Good to see you all. Thanks. Great to be back with you all, man. I've, I've missed you. It's been way too long. And I can actually say Happy New Year because I haven't seen you. So Happy New Year. I can even say Merry Christmas. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Fourth of July. It's been a while. It's been about seven months and I've had an opportunity to come back. So, so grateful to be here. Grateful you. I want to welcome everybody that's joined us online as well. Grateful for y'all as well. Uh, hey, I know that some of you are uh, going back to school uh, this week or maybe you're already back in school. Uh, let me ask, any, any, any of you students love to write? You, you say writing is one of my favorite things to do. Anybody like to like writing? Any English teachers here? Uh, communication majors, uh, journalists, uh, wannabe Pulitzer Prize winners, uh, any, any authors? Well, if, if you're one of those type of people, you probably know what simile is. Now, in case you don't, let me give you a definition of simile. It's a figure of speech involving the comparison of one thing with another thing of a different kind, used to make a description more emphatic or vivid. Now, let me just give you an example of simile. I ran across some attempts uh, from actual college students to use simile in their writing classes, and these are awesome. Let me give you my top, my top five. One college student wrote this. The little boat gently drifted across the pond exactly the way a bowling ball wouldn't. That's an attempt at using simile. I like this one. John and Mary had never met. They were like two hummingbirds who had also never met. <laughs> this, one's, this one's so romantic. Her hair glistened in the rain like nose hair after a sneeze. <laughs> oh, check this one out. <laughs> Long separated by cruel fate, the star-crossed lovers raced across the grassy field toward each other like two freight trains, one having left Cleveland at 6.36 p.m. traveling. If, if you've ever taken the ACT or the SAT, you know where that student was coming from, right? And the last one, her vocabulary was as bad as, like, whatever. I mean, those are classic. Let me, let me just give you one more. Debt crashed down upon them and buried them like an avalanche on a cold, dark mountain. I wrote that one because I've been there. And if you have to, you know that was not very funny, and it just about feels just like that. Last week, uh, Reese kicked off this little series we're calling Lift Ticket, uh, talking about how it's a slippery slope to navigate. And when you are snowed under this avalanche of debt, there really is this feeling of desperation, isn't there? There's a whole lot of stress that comes into your life. You feel like you've almost been buried alive. And maybe that's why Jesus talked about money twice as much as he did about heaven and hell combined. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus tells have to do with money. Five times more is said about money than it is about prayer. And while there are 500 verses in the New Testament about prayer and faith, there are over 2,000 verses dealing with money and possessions. I mean, it's why Jesus warned us, listen, where your heart is, there your treasure is also. He just knew that money had, a, had an opportunity to steal our heart away from God. Now, I just want to tell you up front, this, this series is in no way designed to, like, to bang some more bucks out of church folks. It's not to pile on guilt. It's not to make anybody beat anybody up for financial failures. I mean, Debbie and I, we made a boatload of financial mistakes. We, we, early on, we were clueless. So we're, what we're trying to do is just trying to learn some helpful stuff together. I didn't get a whole lot of teaching or, or practical help about managing money when I was growing, growing up. My, my dad was a really good guy. He worked really hard, but he's also a compulsive gambler and would often blow whatever little we had saved. Our family felt a lot of financial insecurity in our church. Uh, they, they told us we ought to give, 
But I can never remember any practical teaching about how to handle our finances in a God-honoring way. I mean, there wasn't Financial Peace University. There were very few books written about it. And then add to that, if more than just a few character defects I had on my own, I didn't do, always do a great job of handling the money that God had given me to manage. And that's why I'm excited about this series. Hopefully it will help all of us avoid some of the mistakes that me and millions of other people have made. And perhaps along the way, we can let God's word get hidden in our heart. And maybe some character issues can get resolved. And, and maybe, just maybe, we can learn together some practical principles. So that instead of feeling buried alive all the time with financial pressure, we can walk with a measure of financial freedom. Now, when you are learning to ski, if you've ever skied before, you have to go the bunny slopes first. And you got to learn some basics. Now, if you are athletic, you think you know how to do this. You think, I got this. I got, I got this. But trust me, you don't have that. You, you, first thing you need to learn, you need to learn how to do this. You have to learn how to, what they call the snow plow. If you don't know how to snow plow, you're, you're, you're toast. I mean, you got to learn how to turn. you got to learn how to stop. you got to learn how to get back up. Now, the first time I ever went skiing, uh, I played sports uh, all my life, and in my athletic pride, I dismissed the lessons that they were given. I said, this looks like a piece of cake. I got this. <laughs> it was awful. I got, I got turned around completely and started flying down this hill backwards. And I had some buddies that were on the ski lift, and they looked down. They said, oh, look at that dude skiing backwards. He's really good. And they went, oh, man, that's bro. He didn't have a clue what he's doing. I was just flying backwards. I didn't know how to do anything. I'm just fortunate I didn't kill myself that day. And because you're not quite ready either for the ski lift chairs, because you talk about an awkward thing to get out of when you don't know how to get out of them. You're not ready for that yet. So you kind of stay on the bunny slopes where they have this thing called a tow rope. And it just kind of gently pulls you up the hill. So I thought today, if it's okay with y'all, let's just stay on the bunny slopes and maybe ask God to put our hands on the tow rope. And I know from experience that if we'll just get a firm grip of these basics, they can start to pull us up out of things that we've learned in the past and help us navigate our, our life in a better way. So I'm going to give you the very first basic principle first. Here it is. God owns it all. Do you know that? I forgot that. I think we forget that. God owns it all. Jesus would tell these stories sometimes that involved simile because he was like brilliant at it. He would often begin his stories with, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a guy who finds a buried treasure in a field and sells everything he has to buy that field. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a shepherd who has 100 sheep and he, and he loses one, he leaves a 99 and he goes after that one lost one. The, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, fresh wine. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. The kingdom of heaven is, is, is like a mustard seed. It's like a net. It's like a wedding reception. On and on, Jesus would use simile. And I want to use one of his stories as kind of a backdrop of some of this today. And some of you might be familiar with this story. It's found in Matthew chapter 25. It's one of those parables, one of those stories that Jesus would tell. And this is how he starts. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to, the, to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it proportionate to their abilities. He then left on his trip. Now, did you see our first basic principle hidden in that paragraph? He entrusted his money to them. Anybody teaching kids how to drive right now? Anybody doing that? Can we just pause and pray for these people right now? <laughs> yeah, when my kids start to learn how to drive, I entrusted my car to them. There was never any question that it belonged to me. I could take back my car at any time for any reason. They only had responsibilities while I maintained the rights of ownership. And in the same way, every single possession that I have, including, quote, unquote, my car, really belongs to my father. I might possess a lot of stuff, but I own absolutely nothing. You see, an owner has rights. A manager has responsibilities. I am simply managing his resources. 
I mean, this principle is woven all throughout Scripture. For instance, in the Old Testament of the Bible, God reminds a, a guy named Moses, he says, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything, everything in it. And then Moses reminds the people, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. In a conversation with a guy named Job, you might have heard of him before, God says this to him, who has a claim against me that I must pay? Because everything under heaven already belongs to me. God, through one of the prophets, a guy named Haggai, reminds the people, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine. A worship leader named Asaph penned these words from the Lord in Psalm chapter 50, for every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine, and all that is in it. Now listen to me. God is not on an ego trip when he says all this. I mean, we all know from experience that God is not like a selfish hoarder going, mine. He's a giver. God just knows that we have a tendency to puff up ourselves with self-sufficiency, and we go through our life saying, it's all mine. And that's what gets us in trouble. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. King David, the guy who wrote that one, He also said this, after God's people had poured out this incredibly generous offering back to God, you would think as a leader, David would say to God, hey God, did you see what we just did? Did you see what we, did you I'm a pretty good leader, right? Our people came together and we did this for you. He doesn't do that. Instead, look what he says. He says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have only given you only what comes from your you see, the Bible's pretty clear about this. God owns it all. And if I really get a firm grasp of this, it frees me up to let him take back whatever he wants whenever he wants it. It's his anyway. While we were ministering in Las Vegas, I drove a really old car that needed a whole bunch of repairs, and we'd been saving to get something else someday. Uh, but it was serviceable. You know, I had good tires and a radio. That's all you need, Right. And the paint was faded all over the thing. The passenger window was duct taped shut. One door handle was missing. It was an impressive ride. We were on our way from Las Vegas to uh, California, and the transmission fell out in Barstow, California, which if you don't know is a gorgeous spot to break down. And I simply coasted down the exit ramp, uh, coasted down a hill, right into a car dealership. And I said, God, your car broke. (laughs) Now what do I do? I've got a car full of kids. We left that old junker there and bought a car right there on the spot. And I had a lot of peace about it. Our kids will never forget that story. This principle allows me to see that not only is my like giving a spiritual decision, but every spending decision is a spiritual decision. It's all God's stuff. Nothing's more spiritual about giving than buying a car or taking a vacation or going to grocery, or remodeling the bathroom or playing golf or paying taxes or paying off debt. I'm using his resources to do all of that. Now, I have a great deal of latitude in how I use it, and as our Father, He even wants you and me to enjoy it, but it's still His, and I'm going to have to give an account someday of how I managed His money, because He owns it all. This first principle has really helped me get the who right, and the second one I want to give you has been helpful for me to understand the why behind all the money stuff. The second principle is this. God has enrolled us in character development school. Do you know that? God has enrolled us in character development school. See, I believe the most important thing you bring home from work is not your paycheck. It's your character. God cares more about your character and mine than anything else, and he will use all kinds of things along the way to shape us. He'll use jobs. He'll use kids. He'll use parents, in-laws, school, difficult neighbors, tough bosses, hard-nosed coaches, lingering illness, tragic losses. He will use all the stuff that this sometimes unfair life throws at us to shape our character and make us more like Jesus. Because, gang, that's his goal, to make us more like Jesus. And money management is one of those things that just has a way of growing us up. I heard years ago that there are at least three ways that God uses money. He used it as a tool, as a test, 
and as a testimony. A tool, a test, and a testimony. First of all, he uses it as a tool. His desire is to put us on the potter's wheel. He longs to put his loving hands on us and shape us and mold us. And he uses money kind of like as a chisel to shape all the drives and passions and appetites within each of us. For instance, I believe that God has placed within each one of us this desire to excel. Because God's an active God who does things with excellence, and you and I are made in his image. And I don't know about you, I want an excellent surgeon. I want an electrician who cares about his or her craft. I mean, LeBron scores a 30-point triple-double and says post-game, I got to get better on defense. I would say that three out of four weekends, I go home after preaching and think I didn't do exactly what I wanted to do. I didn't say it exactly the way I wanted to say it. I got to get better at that. There's nothing wrong with a healthy desire to excel. There's nothing wrong with healthy ambition. And a man or a woman who is gifted to make money ought to do it with excellence. However, we cannot be naive in thinking that along with that drive doesn't come a whole bunch of potentially damaging temptations as well. Greed and self-indulgence and apathy and envy and pride. In fact, did you know the stats show that high achievers, people who make more than $100,000 a year, give a smaller percentage to charity than those who make less? You see, if, if ambition is not balanced... As our possessions grow, our character can shrink. So God uses our finances, whether we have a little or a lot, as a tool to shape those ambitions and those drives and those attitudes and our compassion, our generosity, and our contentment. We ought to be continually asking, God, what are you, what are you trying to teach me through all this that I have? What do, what do you need to chip away in me that will make me more like Jesus? So God uses our money as a tool to shape our character which is priceless to him. And he also uses our money as a test, as a test. I've discovered that money can test my motives. It can make me ask, what am I really about in this short life? I mean, who am I really? Do I really love God? Do I genuinely care about other people? Is my heart expanding with generosity to share with other people? Or truthfully, am I shrinking inside? Proverbs 1.19 says, when you, when you grab all you can get, that's what happens. The more you get, the less you are. It can test my motives. It can also test my integrity. God wants to know if you and I will be honest with earning and managing his money. Again, it's not the money. It's not about how much you earn, but rather how did you earn it and how are you using it? He wants to know, is this helping you grow in honesty and compassion and integrity? And several years ago, when you could still do this, I pumped gas in my truck, and I pulled away from the gas station, totally forgetting to pay. Anybody else ever done that? Uh, I got all, all the way home, and it hit me. Oh, my goodness, I didn't pay for the gas. I pulled out of my drive. I've been 20 minutes away. Drove back to the gas station, walked in, and said, I'm so sorry, man. I, I totally spaced out, and I drove away without paying for my gas. And the guy behind the counter said, hey, man, thanks for coming back, because a lot of people don't do that. And by the way, man, I love coming to your church. Oh, my goodness. That was close right there. That was close. Not only does it test my motives and my integrity, but it also tests my ability to manage important stuff. Can I be really trusted with things that really matter? Let's go back to Jesus' story for a minute there in Matthew 25, verse 16. The servant who'd received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work, and he earned two more. They just took what the owner gave them and wisely put it to work. And notice the amount was not important at all. Now, I want you to see to the five-bag guy and the two-bag guy, he says the exact same thing. The master was full of praise, verse 21. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who'd received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I've earned two more. The master said, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You, you've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The exact same commendations to both of them. So it's not a dollar amount. God is simply testing our ability to manage temporary things like money 
to see if he can entrust us with eternal things, really important things, like the priceless lives of people. Jesus said on another occasion in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 10, he said, unless you're faithful in small matters, you won't be faithful in large ones. I mean, even if you cheat a little, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who's going to trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's money, why should you be trusted with money of your own? See, the truth is no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You just can't serve both God and money. So in the school of character development, God uses money as a tool, as a test, and as a testimony. See, more than what I just verbally stand up here and say, the way I handle my resources reveals what I'm really passionate about and how I truly, truly feel about God. I want you to look at the last guy in the story, verse 24. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. So I was afraid, and I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. I think he got that because this guy obviously didn't know the master's character at all. Even calls him harsh and dishonest, accused him of things that weren't true at all, probably to excuse his own irresponsibility. Or maybe, just maybe, he was ticked off that he only got one bag and the other two got more. So he just took whatever was given to him, put it on the shelf, went through his life doing his own thing. His heart was never about pleasing the one who had blessed him with the resources. And gang, money testifies to the world about how you and I truly feel about God. Whether we really know him, whether we really love him, whether we really trust him or not. God reminds us in Hebrews chapter 13, he says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Just be content with what you've been given because God has said, I'm never going to leave you. I'll never bail on you. I'll never abandon you. That's the truth about God. He's not a harsh man like the one bag dude said. If you keep your life free from the love of money, you can see the truth of God's character. And your life becomes this gratitude-filled testimony to the watching family and kids and neighbors and coworkers and classmates and teammates of how you trust the God who has given you more than enough. I talked with a wonderful lady in a lobby uh, at church one weekend who told me that she had extended uh, medical care for her husband and that had left her with all kinds of uh, debt when he passed away. And he had, uh, he had good insurance, she said, but still with all the du du deductibles and uh, all the medicines, the bills just piled up. And she was not only devastated with grief over the loss of her husband, uh, but she had bouts of depression and just overwhelmed, feeling like she was buried alive by all this debt. So a friend told her about Financial Peace University, and she went and just sto slowly started chipping away at it. And she told me it took her a disciplined three and a half years until she was finally debt-free. And she was so grateful for the help that God had given her and the way he shaped her character in the process and the way he kept assuring her. He said, I felt like God really told me all the time, I will never leave you, I will never abandon you. And I just told her, I said, I gave her a hug, I said, you're, you're such a hero to us. Because I think there's something in each one of us that says, I want to cut class. I don't want to go to character development school. Go to Financial Peace University, how long is that? Nine weeks? Oh, no way, man. Get on a budget? No, I'm more spontaneous with my cash. Spend three or four years trying to get free, debt free like that lady? Are you kidding me? I got to find a way to hit it big right now. Can I just get something off my chest? I'm going to without your permission anyway. A lot of people in our culture want to get rich quick. They want to get freed up financially fast. I have lived among the video poker and blackjack addicts of Las Vegas. I have stood in line at convenience stores with a guy spending 100 bucks on lottery tickets while he put 10 bucks of gas in an old car that had three or four hungry kids sitting in it. I grew up in the home of a compulsive gambler who had racing forms all over the back seat of his car and placed a call to a bookie every day of his life for decades. I've watched men, especially men, 
take fantasy football to a whole nother level in hopes of hitting it big someday. I've seen people obsess over the stock market or over their cryptocurrency, whatever that is, being up or down to the point of it absolutely controlling their life. I've seen men and women sink their money into get-rich-quick schemes and lose everything they had. So I've had to ask myself, why do people do that? Why do people want to get rich quick? Because it requires no character. It just requires luck. Pick the Powerball, pick the trifecta, chase the hot stock tip, guess the point spread. And all the while, God is saying, you're missing the point. I'm trying to develop character in your life. And one of the ways I want to do that is let you manage my money and learn priceless traits like wisdom and discipline and patience and perseverance and conviction and self-control and delayed gratification and gratitude and contentment because that's what counts. Gang, that's the real long-term payout, and the Powerball can't give you that. Now, these two basic principles have been so formative in my understanding of handling money. They really were the tow rope that pulled me up and out of my thinking and my mess. God owns it all. And he has enrolled me in character development school, and he will use money as a tool, as a test, and as a testimony. And I can't tell you how stoked I am that so many of you are saying in this new year, you know what, I want to be a good manager of what God has given me. I want to live freely. I want to live lightly. I want to cultivate contentment. I want to have peace in my life. I really do want to make a difference with my resources and my life, but I can sure use a plan. And that's why we're pointing everybody to Financial Peace University, because I know personally that financial freedom cannot be achieved without some kind of a game plan. I heard, I heard a guy say one time, my goal is to get my life and my cash to run out at the exact same time. <laughs> and then he said, in fact, if I can die next Tuesday, everything's going to work out. That, that's not a plan. That's not a plan. You've got to get a plan. And Financial Peace University can really help you with all the specifics of a plan. And Benji's going to unpack some of that next weekend. But here's what I think derails us. This is just the way I, I've looked at my own life. You know, we're always going to look around and see people with more bags of silver than us. And it makes us feel like that one bag guy. My kids were... Uh, young, we went on a vacation to Hilton Head, South Carolina. Anybody ever been to Hilton Head? You know where it is? Really nice place, beautiful place. And I was a youth pastor at the time, and, and I drove a really old, goofy-looking station wagon with a car-top carrier on top. It looked like Clark Griswold going on vacation. And uh, we were driving around Hilton Head, and I noticed that, that it seemed like to me anyway, that everybody there had a really nice car except for me. I mean, they were super nice cars. And I thought, what do these people do for a living? Then I went to a place called Harbor Town on the island where there were these $10 million yachts parked in the harbor and these beautiful condos and everybody had on fashionable clothes and as they got out of their really nice cars. And I got so envious thinking, God, what do these people do? And look at, look at our family. And I, I just got so envious. It just was working on the inside of me. And uh, th this guy comes out by a tree on by a little, little deck there by the harbor, and he does it every night. I think he still does it, actually. And he's got a guitar, and he sings some songs. And when he starts singing, all the kids from the condos come out and sit on the stage. And he does like a show, and they get up and they sing. The kids do and stuff. And all the parents got their, you know, recorders out, their videos, video and everything. And uh, so all the kids come up on stage. And I look around for my kids, and they're gone. I thought, where, am I, where, where'd they go? And they're up on stage too, man. They went right up there with the rest of these kids. And my kids aren't dressed like the other kids. Uh, they're, they're, they, we just came from the beach, and they're, 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 they were looking pretty rough. And uh, this little girl gets up. She's got this beautiful little dress on, a bow in her hair. And the guy says, who wants to sing? The little girl goes like that. He goes, okay, why don't you sing? She gets up. You are my sunshine. My own. It was just beautiful. This little kid, you know. And then he goes, who else wants to sing? I see this hand shoot up. Oh, 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 oh. And I see it's my son, Derek. And I'm going, no, 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 no. <laughs> and Derek stands up. And he was a stocky little kid. He was five years old, a kindergartner. And a stocky little dude. And he was sunburned. He had on an old Milligan College t-shirt with a hole that big in the middle of it. <laughs> and uh, it had sand all over him. He had a buzz haircut and freckles everywhere. And the guy goes, as soon as he stands up, he goes, wow, you're a big one. He goes, yep. He goes, what's your name? He goes, Derek. He goes, where are you from, Derek? And Derek goes, 
Kentucky? And the guy goes, oh, like that explained it. I don't, I don't know what, it, what he meant by that. And, <laughs> and uh, he goes, Derek, uh, where'd you get that haircut? He goes, I don't know. He goes, come on, man, where'd you get that haircut? He goes, I don't know. He goes, well, are you in the Marines? Where'd you get a haircut like that? He goes, I don't. He goes, come on, Derek, where'd you get your haircut? He goes, in front of all these rich people. My pappy cut it with the dog clippers. Uh, oh, man, I want to crawl under my seat. Because it was true, we did. Before we left on vacation, got the dog clippers out and just buzzed his head. And uh, oh, my goodness, I was so embarrassed. And everybody's looking for his poor parents with their camcorders and, you know, trying to track us down. And then the guy goes, what, what song do you want to sing? And Derek goes, all my exes live in Texas. <laughs> and he sang it, brought the house down. Wins the talent show that night. And you know what the prize was? A brand new t-shirt. Because he needed one. I was so grateful for that. We laughed all the way to the car. The next day I'm laying on the beach. I just start cracking up thinking about this. And it's like God just spoke to me there on the beach. He says, bro, why were you so envious of all those people? Man, you're loaded. You could not be richer. I mean, who needs a fancy car when you've got a kid like Derek? Come on. He's a kid that loves God. You guys love each other. And man, it's like, and I'm telling you that to, to, to maybe make you understand you're rich. God has blessed you. If you live in this country, especially you're richer than 99% of the people in this world. There was a study done in Newsweek a while back. And they asked people, okay, what would it, how much money would it take to make you happy? How much are we talking about here? And they found that people that made $25,000, they would need to make $54,000 to be happy. People that made $100,000 said they would have to make $192,000 a year to feel satisfied and to feel content. Here's what they concluded with their exhaustive research. Whatever amount you have, it takes twice as much to make you happy. In other words, it's a moving target, which means if you think it's like your money and you have to take care of yourself, no matter how much you have, you'll always be wishing that you made twice as much. But when we understand that God is the owner of all things and he's the giver of all good gifts, we understand that it belongs to God, it just takes a lot of pressure off. We just trust whatever he allocates his resources to us, how he sees fit. We can be grateful for whatever he's blessed us with. We can acknowledge that we're already loaded, we're already rich, and just be content as we work hard to be a good manager of whatever he has entrusted to us. Now, like I said, I, I never had any financial training whatsoever. So when Debbie and I first got married, I was clueless, and she wasn't much better. We got married in between our junior and senior year of college, and we were both going to school, and I was working several jobs, so was she, and we made very little money. But then one day, it all changed. We got this letter in the mail with a plastic card attached that said on the outside of the envelope, you are approved. Approved? I've been searching for approval all my life. Someone approves me, and it didn't take long for us to get on the wrong end of compounding interest with credit card purchases, and which added unneeded stress in our lives and our marriage, and we had to slowly and intentionally dig out from under some very stupid, impulsive decisions from the past. But with God's wisdom and God's supernatural help through the years, we started consistently just working a plan, and for a few decades now, Debbie and I have been able to walk financially free and things like compassion and trust and generosity and peace and joy, those things now guide our life. We, we learned this novel concept called a budget. You ever heard of that? It's called a budget. We started with envelopes. We put cash in envelopes and marked the envelopes with like, like uh, you know, I had entertainment envelope, we had grocery envelope, I, we had haircut envelope. Mine was pretty much empty. Um, we had all kinds of different, we just put them in a drawer and whenever the envelope was empty, we were done with that, that item for that for that month, and that, that got us started on, on, a, on a budget. We started an emergency fund uh, so we wouldn't get buried alive by the unexpected hot water heater flame out. Uh, we just decided that we were going to start working a plan and a consistent giving plan. We, we just personally decided, just, just Debbie and I, that we were going to give at least 10% of our income to whatever was going uh, to advance God's purpose to whatever local church we were part of. And then in addition, we were going to intentionally set aside some other little money and a little fun just to bless people in the moment, people that just needed a hand. 
you know, maybe as a family member, or maybe as a neighbor, or maybe it's even a stranger that just needed some help, and we would be able to help them as we felt led. And please, please hear me. I am not telling you this to say, hey, look at us. Far from it. God brought us such a long way from our selfish, self-centered impulsiveness. We just decided together that we're going to get a plan. And we're going to practice consistent gratitude and consistent generosity. And we were going to actually start doing what Scripture had said in Proverbs chapter 3, where it says, just honor the Lord by giving in the first part of your income. And we started doing that. We've been incredibly blessed through the years. And we set as a goal to have this verse from Philippians 4 to find our lives. And by God's grace, we're getting closer. We're not there yet, but we're getting closer. And it always encourages me to read the words of this guy named Paul who wrote, these, wrote this from prison. He said, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Just to practice gratitude and learn contentment, to live freely and generously, recognizing that he owns it all, it's just such a better way to live your life. And God wants to help you get there. He really does. He cares. He cares about this area of your life, and he, he just wants you to experience contentment and peace and freedom in every area of your life. And it all starts by entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ, who died to cancel all of our sin debt and pull us up out of the rebellion that had us buried alive. And then as we cooperate with him and submit to his loving leadership every day, we, we actually start walking free. So I just pray you're here each week of, of the series and that you'll head to Financial Peace University and grab hold of the tow rope, tow rope and let God start to pull you up so we can get about becoming men and women of great character who live our lives with gratitude and generosity and a whole lot of compassion and joy. I want you to pray with me about this. God, I'm, I'm so grateful that uh, this is one of those areas that you um, just talk to us directly about. You don't skirt around the issue. You just tell us this, this is going to be something that could really screw up our life. It could be something that would do incredible good in this world. But it's also something that could steal our heart away from you and get us traveling down the road of self-sufficiency and pride and uncontrolled ambition and wrong motives. It can cause us to be dishonest. Um, and Lord, that's just so far from the character you want to produce in us. So God, I, I just pray as, as we just honestly get about this that we would be like that clay on a potter's wheel and you just chip away at us Shape us to be more like Jesus, most generous person who ever walked this planet, the most selfless. And I pray that would happen to us. Now, I pray you, you give us the want to and the humility to say, you know what, I might need something like Financial Peace University. I, I need to learn some stuff because I, I don't really know much about this. Or I need a refresher. I need to get back on track. And God, I pray that that would revolutionize people's lives. God, just talking to a guy in the lobby this morning who said it, they went through it and just changed the trajectory of their life. And I, th I thank you that there's resources like that out there. And, and I, just, I pray, God, that we take advantage of that and let you bring some freedom into our lives. And God, we're not, we, don't, we don't want financial independence. We don't want financial arrogance. We just want to walk free, grateful for what you've given us and grateful that we get a chance to make a difference in this world through whatever you've put in our hands. So, Father, thank you so much. I pray that you stamp all these verses and stuff in our heart today, that your Holy Spirit would bring them to our mind as we go throughout the week. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.